this is quite the ring. This is the 2019 Winnipeg Blue Bomber Grey Cup ring. And congratulations boys, yes you will be getting another one as you are the 2021 Grey Cup champions. So today we'll talk a little bit about football, a little bit about the Blue Bombers, but more importantly about a very special person, Gene Lukusiak. He was a former Winnipeg Blue Bomber and unfortunately Gene never won a Grey Cup or got to have one of these rings. But I will be sitting down with his wife Lynn and his daughter Corey as they reflect on his passing and share with us on what they've learned and how the whole 2021 year has transpired and really push them to looking forward to a brighter future. This is Hugh at Home. It is so wonderful to see both of you, Lynn and Corey. And I have to say, ladies, you look fantastic in those colors. And I, I think it's just a sign, right? I mean, we have to move forward. We want color in our lives. We want joy and we want happiness. So, you know, this is all about uh, your journey, Lynn and Corey together. Uh, Jean, of course, uh, former Blue Bomber, um, had al Alzheimer's, lived with Alzheimer's. Uh, your story to Lynn on being a caregiver um, has been so, I guess, real and raw and has given hope to so many people. But today now, Lynn and Corey, let's talk about the year that has been. Uh, 2021 and what it has brought both of you and how you've moved forward. So let's start with you, Lynn. Well, um, well, Jean passed um, at the end of July of 2020. And that was, you know, not exactly the beginning of all of our lockdowns, but we were certainly, we were certainly into it. And um, it was a very, uh, I mean, it was a very challenging time, obviously, um, having him for a very short period of time at Riverview, um, where we were restricted to window visits and, you know, just not being together. We were <clears throat> somewhat fortunate and I call it a little stroke of grace. Um, there was an opening uh, of restrictions in um, September of 2020. So we were able to have a celebration of life for Jean um, where we could invite 50 people and that felt just perfect. So we felt like um, as a family uh, that we were able to, you know, um, sort of deal with bring a little bit of closure I suppose and then um yes and so then all of 2021 um I'm I'm doing well I would say <laughs> um and I I think what when I you know try and focus on the positive of all of this um during COVID it really um I guess maybe it's, uh, for me, it was a good time to dive into my grieving process um, because life was very simple. Um, we weren't going out. A lot of the normal things that we do, you know, to distract ourselves in life um, weren't there. And so I was, I, I was face to face now um, with are with the loss of Jean. And, you know, to be honest, in, in, in a certain way, um, I, I was happy for him that he, in his champion style, was able to really take the bull by the horns and say, you know, this is not a life for me. And he, he, um, he, I think in, a, in his own way, he expedited his own process of leaving. And as a family, we were able to spend some time with him, luckily, with an, another opening and, and, and really share everything that we had to share. I was so grateful for that, that I, I think all of us as a family felt that nothing was left unsaid. And that we just really, um, because we love there was so much love uh in the air 
even in that process uh, that we were able to give him permission to go. And uh, so in a way that felt uplifting. And I know maybe some people that's hard to relate mm-hmm. um, when, when you're losing, you know, um, the love of your life. But <clears throat> what I've really, um, what through the process of 2021 and being home and reading and um, meditating, writing, um, <laughs> that I, I came to realize that like Jean was gone, but the love um, that we shared was just expanding. And that kind of surprised me. In mm-hmm. fact, it really surprised me. So in a way, um, I almost didn't know how to deal with it um, because it was overwhelming for me at times. Um, but, you know, it's been a year and a half now and, and uh you know, our life is, uh, I, like I say, I'm grateful for that downtime to just really come face to face with what we were dealing with. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, you're, you're so right in everything, all the touch points, Lynn. Corey, for yourself, has the journey been as, I, get, I won't say easy, but as wonderful that it has been for your mom? Yeah, I think because we live together, there's three generations of women living together now in this house. And my daughter and I moved in uh, about a year and a half before my dad died to help. And during that time, we did a lot of grieving. And it was really hard when dad was still alive. And um, we got to support one another in the care. And then we we really stepped up as a family to support one another in his passing. And, you know, with mom and I both being yoga teachers, Mm -hmm. we have a way of communicating that's almost above, I think how, uh, it's a way of connecting with the higher always, even when we were in our grieving process, we were always able to, connect with one another in a very loving way, leaning on our faith, our personal faith. And this past year has been a year of surrender, a year of letting dad go. And mom's right, his love has shown up in such profound, beautiful ways this year in all of our family and in our day-to-day lives. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten to grieve and support each other even in lockdown having all three of us living together we've been able to support one another and i'm really i think we've done an exceptional job of supporting each other and holding each other up and um and i feel like this past year has been a watershed we've got to let go of the past and now we're really stepping into the future and it feels authentic and it feels hopeful. Mm. Well, and I wanna point out too, uh, you touched on it, Corey, yes, uh, your mom and you both, um, you know, lovers of yoga, meditation. And I think too as well, that definitely has helped both of you too not only to clear your mind, but to actually, like you said, help come to grips with what you're feeling internally. So I'm going to go back to Lynn, and then Corey, you can answer too as well. Had there not been COVID, had there not been a lockdown where we were forced to be by ourselves or in some sort of isolation, you would have been bombarded, I am sure, Lynn, with friends and family wanting to talk to you, be with you, you know, extend their, you know, condolences, their sympathies, that you would be all the time giving to them and not thinking about what you need yourself. So I'm kind of thinking Mm -hmm. if we kind of look at how we grieve, maybe part of what you and Corey, your journeys have been, could help. Am I on the right path, Lynn? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, um, 
I found that um, I'm, in, I'm in a writing group and I have been for the last oh, I, almost five years. And um, it's a small writing circle. We have a, a, a teacher, a facilitator, who is a very inspiring woman. And that, um, that group, uh, we gather once a month and um, we used to gather around my dining room table, but uh, of course now we're gathering Zoom wise. But, but that group um, gave me a, a really safe uh, place mm -hmm. to, to write what I was feeling and, and to really, um, because the group started before Jean passed and with Alzheimer's, there's so many changes that are constantly happening and you're, it's just like you're, there's never one um, phase that, that he would settle into that we could say, oh, well, now we can deal with this because things kept changing. And so the writing became very therapeutic for me. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, um, and it took me a bit to be able to really write from my heart and write what I was feeling, write what, um, what was challenging and, and to be heard um, by my, by my group mm -hmm. and, and to, uh, so that, so the, the writing became a really, really important process. And, and I must say when Jean was still alive, um, the, the challenge of dealing with his Alzheimer's was overwhelming mm -hmm. in, uh, it was overwhelming to me emotionally and to my nervous system and so on. So it was even difficult for me to meditate. It was very difficult for me to um, rely on the practices that had been supporting me for the last 25 years. Um, this whole, his whole Alzheimer's, this whole thing that we were dealing with brought me like really raw right on the surface. And, and so, so the writing was, was a gift and and to be able to to share and i think a lot of the grieving happened before he passed mm -hmm. and i was able to articulate that um i didn't realize that's what i was doing at the time but but i did realize it afterwards mm -hmm. and for yourself corey uh if you take a look back back uh, what comes to mind in your process of grieving and acceptance, I think, at the end, too. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to say this COVID thing, there's no, there's no such thing as coincidence, right? And it felt to me like a divine timing that we were being given uh, a container, a real nurturing container to be with one another and to not be distracted by what's going on out there in the world and going about our day-to-day -day lives. But it gave us a space to just let down and be with what was coming up. And I know from my perspective, it was really great because as I was dealing with my own stuff, my own grieving, I was watching mom in her own grieving and my daughter too in her own way but I was watching my mom also come back to life. And that was an incredible gift. And the writing for, for you, mom, was, <laughs> it was a great outlet that helped her process what was going on and move through. And so even though we had had this great loss and we lost, you know, sort of the head of the family, what's happened is that our family has started to blossom. Our family is now starting to come back to life. And uh, like I said before, Jean is still very present in our day-to-day -day lives. And in some ways, I think more present now than he was in the last several years of his life. Mm -hmm. And so because we have such a small, tight-knit family, this this COVID bubble has been an incredible um, opportunity for each one of us to grieve and now to be reborn. Oh. 
Well, the story <laughs> will continue because when we come back, we're going to talk about a certain story that Lynn wrote uh, just this past December that really sparked and I guess rekindled a lot of feelings. And uh, But right now though, uh, Lynn and Corey, we're going to replay this wonderful story called Gene's Ride and how his other family, the Blue Bomber alumni, gathered around him and supported him. And it was a big fundraiser, Cycle on Life, for Riverview Health Center Foundation and Gene's Ride 2020. Here's the story and you'll get a, a better insight of who Gene Lukusiak was. I was a big Gene Lukusiak fan because here is a kid, a Canadian kid with an Eastern European last name. I've got an Eastern European last name. He plays high school and junior in Sarnia, goes to Tulsa, goes to American College, comes back to Canada, plays a couple games for the Ottawa Rough Riders, and then becomes a part of my beloved Blue Bombers. My beloved Blue Bombers, I can't stress that strongly enough. So I become a big fan of number 31, of Gino Lukusiak, because of that whole history. As then chair of the Riverview Health Center Foundation, I participated a great deal with the Cycle on Life. And Gene and the whole team Lukusiak participated in a big way in the Cycle on Life. Gene was starting to show signs of dementia a number of years ago, and it initially, I don't think we really um, recognized what we were in store for, but there was some memory issues and, and, um, and so over the years, um, you know, as his journey with dementia, Alzheimer's began unfolding and we started recognizing more about what was happening and, and accepting that that's where we were. And then I guess Riverview took on a whole new meaning for us because it was uh, in the neighborhood and, and in, in my heart, I, I, I guess many years ago, I was thinking, well, if this unfolds and, and we, we need uh, long-term care for Gene moving forward, this is for sure where we would, where we would want to place him. Well, Gene Lukusiak, who is a, an ex-Blue Bomber, uh, he and his family were involved with the Cycle on Life. The minute the alumni uh, made an association with us, so they've been very, very involved, and they've been very supportive, and their whole family's been supportive. Uh, and unfortunately, Gene, in the past year, has become a resident here at Riverview. Uh, and we believe we're giving him his best care possible. And I know that the Lukusiaks are still very much supportive of the, of the cycle on life. Over the years, they've raised a fair amount of money, and we share that money with the alumni because the alumni have a goal of trying to teach young people how to play sports safely and make sure that they have the proper protection, make sure that the coaches have the proper techniques in terms of um, training young people in contact sports. So it's been a, you know, a mutually beneficial relationship. And we have become close with a lot of uh, Winnipeg Blue Bomber alumni. This story can be told about this wonderful match between Team Lukusiak, the Bomber alumni, and Riverview. God willing, please let that story be told. And then when Lynn said, I want to tell that story, I was so thrilled. I had tears in my eyes because then I could proudly go to my new board, this group that has invited me and embraced me, my Bomber alumni brethren, and say to them, have I got a story for you. 
Here's the family that's been raising this money for Riverview for years. And here is the magic of tying alumni to Riverview. And now we have, I think, Lynn, we can safely say the first time that one of the Bomber alumni who's fallen victim to what happens when you hit each other with helmets with your head and put yourself at that risk for the entertainment of all the football fans, but not knowing in the 60s and 70s what harm that would cause in the long term. So now with Riverview having that Alzheimer's Center of Excellence and one of our alumni being there, bringing that all to fruition. I mean, I wish and I pray that none of us who've played football and get, have gotten head injuries have to go through Alzheimer's or dementia. We're absolutely delighted that um, this concept of Gene's ride came about and I know that he would absolutely love it. Um, he's always been um, really enthusiastic about you know um, everything that we've taken on as a family and anything that supports his, his Bomber alumni buddies. So, so it feels really special. And, uh, and I just keep telling him every day when I talk to him on the phone and I, I say to him, uh, you know, he doesn't really understand what's going on and I just, I just say to him, you're in such a good place and you're being taken good care of and just keep being the great champion that you've always been and that seems to, that seems to sit well with him. So I, I think he'll be delighted, you know, with the whole ride and, uh, and you know, so is our family. So having it called Gene's Ride and bringing in that new energy from the alumni is absolutely fantastic. We are so thrilled. Welcome back to Hugh at Home, and my guests are Lynn and Corey Lakusiak. And in this second part, we're going to be talking about a certain story, a story that rekindled all of the excitement of the Western Finals here in Winnipeg for, I guess, the first time in a long time. And yeah. I'll let I'll let Lynn, I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> well, why it was uh, um, well, I I can talk about why what? that Western final um, that took place here, you know, Winnipeg versus uh, the Rough Riders. Um, that was the first Western final since 1972. Uh, so it was a rematch. It was a rematch of that 1972 final, uh, which Gene played in. And for some reason, I mean, there's, there's, we've gone to a lot of football games, and a lot of them I've forgotten about, absolutely. But, but, I'll, but I, the memory of that, of the disappointment in that 1972 final was still there. I could still feel it, and so. Um, yeah, so so I um, I have seasons tickets with the Bombers, but I haven't gone to many games because I just I wasn't sure about being in a big crowd and, and so on and so forth. I did get to a couple of games, but I thought there's no way I'm missing this uh, replay of this 1972 Western final. 
and uh, and it was really cold that day. <laughs> it was like minus 20 or something. I don't know what it was, but it was really cold. Mm-hmm. But um, but I went to that game, and and I couldn't really believe how emotionally invested I was in the game, and it brought up a lot of nostalgia. And it was very, I could really feel it. it was very alive. It was very real. And I felt like I had really catapulted back in time. And and I was like, I was invested in that game. And I thought, no, 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 I can't lose this again. Please, we need to win this game. We got to make it right for those guys that played uh, all those years ago. And, um, and sure enough, they did. And so... <clears throat> In my writing circle, um, around that time, um, Marjorie, my writing teacher, had given us a prompt. And one of the prompts was, um, can you write a story about winning and losing? So that was perfect. That was like, okay, I can write about that. And so I, I settled into writing this story um, entitled The Western Final Then and Now. And, and you know, that was... A really that was another therapeutic writing for me and uh, and just fortunately um the bombers won that game <laughs> um i'm not sure how i would have felt if they had lost that. i probably would have written a completely different story i would still would have written but it would have been different oh, so dear. that that was the story and um and my writing group um they 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 encouraged me, like normally our stories stay within our circle, but uh, they encouraged me. They said, you know, bomber fans, or there may be people out there that would really appreciate hearing and reading this story. And so it was upon their encouragement that, uh, in fact, it was Marjorie, our, our fearless leader, that sent the story out. I believe she sent it to you as well, Tracy. Oh, so, yeah, that's kind of what happened with that story. Oh, well, it's wonderful. And I wanted to add to, you felt Jean there at that game, didn't you? What did you, did you feel dad there? Did you feel dad, oh, Jean? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I went. I went with a girlfriend of mine, and um, we were we were there. But you know, there was a point in the game where where the bombers were they they were it looked like they were giving the game away, and I just sat down and I prayed to Jean. I said, "Come on, I know you're here because the energy of the game, and that's when he seems to really show up for us when you're really connected to your heart and the energy is positive and so on." And I said, "I, I know you're here." Get out there and help them. <laughs> <laughs> well, he certainly did, and I think he certainly helped them too in the Grey Cup because there was a point where we thought, oh, again, yeah, exactly. given the way game, and uh, we didn't have, yeah. we're very yeah. surprised and, and actually jubilant about the outcome. Corey, reading this story, does it spark, you know, some memories, but does it also spark, I guess, something new? new found in your mom? Well, my dad retired before I was born. So I never <laughs> knew Jean, the football player. Um, my dad was a football coach for many years, um, but I definitely inherited my dad's athleticism and uh, both my parents' competitive nature. Um, but hearing these stories that my mom writes, it is, uh, it reveals a layer to their relationship that I never knew about. And it gives me a glimpse into the past before I was here and all the stories that they shared together and gives kind of the foundation of their love story, which was very intertwined with the football because mm -hmm. that's how they moved around. And so I feel when she writes these stories, I feel like I'm getting a glimpse into the past and I can feel through mom's writing, I can actually feel and put myself into that situation. And uh, I love it. I love reading her writing. And I often find that there's a lot. She cries a lot when I, she reads my writing. There's uh, always tears. Yeah. Like, and I just love it. I love it. So. Oh, excuse yeah. me. I'm going to cough. 
No, oh, I'm crying too right now. Sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness, I am. Oh. Um. No. <laughs> oh, it's a little emotional here. Um. So I guess. Oh, now my voice is cracking. Um. <laughs> uh, Lynn. Moving forward, will you continue to write, and where will this writing take you? Do you think? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it's taken me a, a fair bit of time to recognize that that I I have a talent for writing. Uh, I didn't really believe that um, in the beginning, um, and so it's been a a process of. Um, well, just accepting the fact that, wow, there, there's something here. And, and I've been told that I'm, I have a knack for telling a story, a heartfelt story. And, and I must say, uh, I mean, I, I can only write when it is heartfelt and from my experience. I can't, uh, I'm not very good at it, and I can't actually even do it, make up stories and just write about fictional stuff. It's that's just not who I am. It has to be like a deeply felt experience. Mm -hmm. And then I'm starting to recognize, and, and I think this whole process of being with Gene through his Alzheimer's, um, you know, I mean, the feelings that were coming up and what I learned about even him. And it was just, mm, it was something that I, that I couldn't ignore. But, but I must say, what is foundational, I think, to all of that has been my yoga and meditation practice over the past 25 years. And I'm in love with the psychology and the philosophy of yoga. And, and I can, I mean, it's changed my life. And so I think it's that practice of going in, inside mm -hmm. all these years that allows me to feel so deeply and to find maybe the clarity um, to write from that place. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'll continue to write um, well, hope... a memoir. Yeah. Um, oh, that's I fabulous. What it's going to look like. Yes. But you know what? Your story, I think, can give hope to so many other people. And it's all about sharing, right? Your, your lived experience and just to let people know that they're not alone and giving them some sort of purpose, which is wonderful. I guess in closing, Corey, with you, what have you learned about yourself, but also what have you learned new or different about your mom in all of this? I mean, we talk a lot <laughs> because we live together. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what, I'm, what I'm really grateful for is that mom is now capable and uh, and has this new freedom, like I mentioned before, to recreate herself. And my mom has always been very creative. Um, our whole family is very creative. And when she was caring for my dad, she was giving and giving and giving and never able to um, focus on herself. So what I'm noticing now is the further we move away from my dad's death and as we all move through our grieving, that I'm watching my mom come back to life. I'm feeling myself come back to life in a whole new way. And there is, because of this common bond of yoga and a love of life, that's one thing I think all of our family really has is this passion and love for life. And the more we dive into that through meditation, through yoga, through nutrition, it is so encouraging to see my mom begin to thrive and begin to live out her dreams. And as she does that, it creates the platform 
for me to then do that, which then creates the platform for my daughter to do that. And, and even with my brother and his family. So I feel like this past year has been uh, a lot of ancestral healing, a lot of deep conversations and a beautiful liberation back into all that life can offer. Oh, well, you know, it is so wonderful to see both of you thrive, um, not just Lynn, but you, you too, Corey. And I know that Scott and his family too are. I must say, I think Gene is looking down and he's like nodding in approval, seeing, <laughs> seeing his, his family move on and move forward, which I, I know that would probably be his biggest wish. Uh, I want mm -hmm. to let everybody know that Lynn has graciously allowed us to share her story, The Western Final, then and now. You can read the full story on our, our Instagram at I Like You and on our Facebook page too as well. And I think we'll post it on our website too at ilikeyou.com because it is a good story. And who knows, I said maybe a local publisher might pick it up. Lynn, and then you'll, then you'll, you know, you'll have to write another bomber story. Let's hope maybe they can make it uh, three Grey Cups in a row. Who knows? <laughs> I kind of like, I was thinking, oh my God, I wonder if I could have a career in sports casting or something. Like, I really get a kick out of this whole football writing and the, and the memories and sharing. And <laughs> well, you know what? You could be our, our first uh, female commentator. I think that uh, there is a position for you. And I'm, I'm sure a radio station out there will pick you up or, or we'll let you, I'll have you on our show. You can do your... Uh, Football analysis. <laughs> right now, you know, every Sunday it's the NFL people talking, so I'm sure we can figure out exactly. something for the CFL. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Lynn and Corey, for taking this time. And all our love and warm wishes go out to you and your family. And I look forward to the next novel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for inviting us. So the Hive is a climbing and fitness facility, so we're bouldering only, which means no ropes or harnesses. We use mats for protection. The four pillars of our business are climbing, education, health and wellness, and community, and those aspects all kind of come together to create like a five-star climbing experience. Welcome back to Hue at Home. We want to give a very big special thank you to all of our guests on today's show and leave you with this question. What in 2022 is going to inspire you? We want to know, so send us an email to hello at ilikeyou.com or you can message us on Facebook and Instagram at ilikeyou. But for now, please stay safe and healthy and we'll see you next time on Hue at Home.